Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with corned beef and cabbage shepherd's pie. That's right, my favorite corned beef and cabbage recipe and my favorite shepherd's pie recipe are the same recipe. And while this does involve a few extra steps, when compared to your classic traditional boiled corned beef dinner, the payoff at the end is well worth the extra effort. And by the way, a few extra steps does not mean this is not easy. This is actually quite simple to put together, as you're about to see. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by boiling our corned beef. And by boiling, we mean gently simmer. And what we'll do is take our three and a half to four pound piece of corned beef and transfer it into a pot, along with some onions and celery. And then, as you may know, every corned beef comes with that little package of secret herbs and spices. So we'll want to be sure to add that as well. And then what we'll do is add enough cold fresh water to cover the beef. And no, we don't need to add any salt to the water. All right, the corned beef has plenty. Oh, and I should mention, when you go to buy your corned beef, you'll usually have a choice between the flat lean ones and then the thick fatty ones. And guess which one I think you should use. Oh yeah, the thick fat one if you can get it. And then what we'll do is bring this up to a boil over high heat. And yes, if you want to skim some scum, go ahead and skim some scum. But personally, I'm not skimming any scum. I think those are just foamy proteins. And then once our pot's boiling, we'll back our heat down to low. And then we'll cover this and we'll let it simmer gently for three and a half hours. And believe it or not, that's it. And then if everything goes according to plan, about three and a half hours later, your corned beef should look like this. And we will go ahead and stab that with a giant fork and remove that to a bowl. And if you don't have one giant fork, use two regular forks, but be very careful. And that's it. Once our beef's been bowled, we'll simply let that cool down before we cut it up. And while we're waiting for that, we'll go ahead and cook our vegetables in that same amazing flavorful broth which I do at this point like to taste for salt, and hopefully it's perfect. But if it tastes like it needs some, go ahead and throw some in. And then what we'll do is bring that back to a boil over medium high heat, at which point I'm gonna cook a couple small savoy cabbages, or just regular green cabbage if you want. And once our cooking liquid is boiling, we'll go ahead and transfer that in. And after taking out the core, as you can see, I cut mine into about two inch pieces. But of course your sizes may vary, since you're gonna be the one cutting it. And once we get that all settled down and it comes back to the boil, what we'll do is cook this for five minutes or until that cabbage just starts to soften and sweeten up. Okay, don't forget all these ingredients are going to cook again once they've been shepherd pied. But anyway, we'll go ahead and remove those to a bowl and we'll let that cool down while we move on to cooking the next vegetable, which would be some thickly sliced carrots. And we are pretty much going to do the exact same thing. We're going to cook these for about five minutes or so until they just start to soften up. And again, that's going to depend on how thick you cut them. But that's fine, because you're going to check and test them. And when we think those are done, we'll go ahead and fish those out. And we'll let those cool down alongside our cabbage. And once those are set, we can move on to the last component, which would be the potatoes we're going to mash to do the topping for our shepherd's pie. And I'm thinking we should also reduce our heat down to medium, since we don't want our liquid level reducing down too far as the potatoes cook. And until you've had mashed potatoes, made with potatoes that have been boiled in corned beef cooking liquid, you, my friend, have not had mashed potatoes. In fact, if they sold corned beef broth at the store, I would buy it just to make mashed potatoes with. And then if we want while our potatoes are cooking, we can go ahead and slice up our corned beef, which to make things easier should ideally be fully cooled. And what we'll do first is try to find that fatty seam between the two pieces of meat, and then we'll go ahead and separate it right there. And by the way, you can only do this if you got the good end of the brisket. You people that got stuck with that flat lean end can just start slicing. Speaking of which, no matter what piece of corned beef you ended up with, we're going to want to identify the direction of the meat fibers and cut across those. Or as we call it in the business, slicing across the grain. And I generally don't like to trim off too much fat, but if you do come across a giant solid piece, you can always trim that off if you want. And right here you can see exactly why we prefer that thicker end of the corned beef. I mean, look at that marbling. So we'll go ahead and slice that up, and then we'll head back to the stove to fish out our potatoes. Assuming, of course, they're fully cooked and tender enough to mash. Oh, and do not, under any circumstances, throw away that liquid. All right, we are definitely going to use that. And then to our cooked potatoes, we will add a little touch of butter. Some salt, of course. But be careful, because that cooking liquid was already seasoned. We will also do some freshly ground black pepper, as well as a few shakes of cayenne. And then last but not least, we will pour in some milk, at which point we'll go ahead and mix, smash, and mash this until it's very smooth. 
And yes, in case you're wondering, you are supposed to mash the potatoes with the butter first and then add your milk or cream or whatever liquid you're putting in. But for this, it really doesn't matter because I don't mind if there's a few little lumps here and there. The only thing you gotta be careful about is don't mash too aggressively at the beginning because that milk will definitely splash out. Okay, so start off kind of slowly. And then once it starts to break down and smooth out, you can pick up the pace. And then what we'll do once we mash that as smooth as we want is stop and toss in a handful of Irish cheddar or of course the cheddar of your choice. All right, American, English, mild or sharp, whatever you're into. I mean, you are after all the Billie Eilish of your casseroles Irish. And speaking of bad guy, while I don't care if you use Irish cheddar or not, I do care if you grate it yourself. All right, good guys and gals grate their own cheese. And that's it once that's been mixed in. We can herd all of our ingredients into a buttered casserole dish, starting with our cabbage, which looks like we have way too much. But all we need to do is give that a very firm pressing, and it should compact nicely. And then next up, we will transfer on our carrots and distribute them as best we can, and also give those a little bit of a pressing down before we place over a nice even layer of our corned beef. And as we do this, let's try to make sure we distribute those fattier pieces evenly so that way Patrick Murphy doesn't get all the fatty pieces and Seamus O'Connor doesn't get all the lean ones. So please try to mix things up. And then once we've achieved full corned beef coverage, we'll go ahead and pour in one cup of our beautiful corned beef broth to help keep everything nice and moist as this bakes. And then for the last step, we'll go ahead and spread over our mashed potatoes. But before we spread, we have to dollop. And if we do that before we start spreading, we're gonna ensure we get a much more even layer so we'll go ahead and use the back of our spatula to spread that out as uniformly as we can. At which point we're gonna to switch to a fork to not only do a little bit of fine tuning and make sure we have those potatoes spread all the way to the edge, but we are also gonna use our fork to texture the top. And there's a million different designs you can do, or it may be more, but I like to go with the very traditional method of dragging the fork across this way, although we probably wanna alternate directions so it doesn't start building up on one edge, and then once we've made marks by dragging our fork that way, we will do the exact same thing the long way to create a pattern that is actually not a pattern, which is what makes it such a great pattern. Okay, it ends up being kind of random, but on purpose. And then for one final touch, once that's been completely forked, as I like to sprinkle over a little more grated Irish cheddar over the top, which maybe possibly helps it brown up a little nicer. And that's it, our corned beef and cabbage shepherd's pie. It's now ready to transfer into the center of a 400 degree oven for about 45 minutes to an hour until it's beautifully browned, piping hot, and hopefully looks like this. And then I'm not saying we're smart, but if we were, we would let this sit and rest for about 10 minutes before we tried to serve it up, at which point we can grab a spatula and attempt to cut out a nice square. And yes, for a first piece that came out amazingly well, it's almost as if I had food styled it for like 10 minutes before placing it down. And then we will finish up with a few spring onions, which is what we call scallions when they're in a St. Patrick's Day video. And then for one last very important touch, let's go ahead and serve this with some of those amazing cooking liquids. So beautiful. And that, my friends, like I said in the intro, is not only my favorite version of corned beef and cabbage, but also my favorite version of shepherd's pie. All right, visually, texturally, and taste-wise, just magnificent in every way. And while there's absolutely nothing wrong with a traditional corned beef and cabbage and potato and carrot dinner, one challenge with that since everything's so wet, as soon as you slice your corned beef and serve up, I find that everything gets cold really fast. But here, because we have that delicious and beautiful mashed potato insulation, this is going to stay hot a long time. Plus, this takes all the stress and anxiety out of trying to slice the meat and portion the potatoes and portion the cabbage and vegetables. Okay, here, all that was taken care of during the layering process. So yes, there are a few extra steps involved, but for me to be able to enjoy a final product this amazing makes that little bit of extra effort more than worthwhile. Oh, and you didn't hear this from me, but this format is also great for stretching a little bit of corned beef a long way. So if you have a large clan to feed, I really do think this is a great approach. Which reminds me one last thing. If you happen to have a bunch of smaller baking dishes, this technique is perfect for making smaller individual size portions. So just something to keep in mind. But anyway, whether you do end up making these fun size or in one big casserole dish like we did here, either way, if you're a fan of corned beef and cabbage, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, 
enjoy. Beef and Guinness stew. That's right, we're doing a delicious beef stew featuring Ireland's second most popular export. I believe shamrocks are number one, and it really does make for an incredibly flavorful stew. And with St. Patrick's Day right around the corner, this could be a great menu option. I mean, you don't want to repeat last year where you drank too much green beer and ended up eating Lucky Charms for dinner. That wasn't good. So we're going to start by going over to the stove where I have a heavy skillet on medium-high heat. I'm going to throw in a few slices of bacon that I cut up, and we're going to cook that until all the fat's rendered out, and it's pretty much crisp. All right, it's going to look like that. We're going to turn off the heat. We're going to transfer the bacon into our stew pot, all right, reserving as much of the fat as we can because we're going to use that fat to brown our chunks of beef. So you should have at least a tablespoon or two of fat in there. If it doesn't look like you have enough, add a little splash of vegetable oil, but it should be fine. Crank the heat up too high. And then we're gonna brown some very well seasoned, meaning they were tossed with salt and pepper, cubes of beef chuck. You know we like our beef chuck for stews. That's from the shoulder. Lots of flavor, lots of connective tissue. Really does make a wonderful stew meat. So I just bought a big old beef chuck roast and cut it into like two inch pieces. All right, I didn't show that step. We've showed that many times. It's not very interesting. You take one big piece of meat and make it into lots of smaller pieces. Pretty straightforward. So we wanna brown that very well over high heat. And once those pieces are nicely seared, you can go ahead and dump those right on top of your bacon bits. And then we're gonna use the pan for a third time, this time to soften our onions and get our cooking liquid prepared. So I'm gonna to toss in two onions that I just roughly chopped, kind of a large dice. We're gonna put the heat back on medium and we're gonna sweat those onions for about five minutes. With a big pinch of salt, they'll start to glaze in the bottom a little bit, picking up some of that beautiful caramelization. After about five minutes, I'm gonna dump in my minced garlic. And we don't want that to brown or get bitter. So we're only gonna cook that for about a minute. And you can see through to the bottom of the pan, we have a beautiful fond built up. And you know what fond is, that's all those caramelized juices at the bottom of the pan. So once that garlic is cooked for about a minute, we're gonna go ahead and deglaze with our Guinness beer. There it is, Guinness draft, which is weird because it's in a can. And we're gonna pour that in. So I'm using one, I believe it's a 14 ounce can. And once you pour the beer in, just simply give it a stir with a wooden spoon, scraping along the bottom. We want to make sure all that lusciousness from the bottom of the pan dissolves into this liquid. I would say just give it two or three minutes on medium, stirring like that. And at that point, you can go ahead and dump that into your stew pot. And by the way, don't taste anything yet. It's not going to taste good yet. It's not even really going to smell good yet. It smells a little bit like a wet leprechaun at this point. But don't worry, it's going to get incredibly delicious. So we're going to dump that into our stew pot. And then it's time for the rest of the ingredients, first of which would be some tomato paste. And I wish there was a less attractive way that I could put that in there. All right, so about a quarter cup of tomato paste. I'm also gonna throw in some fresh thyme. Do not pick those leaves off. It's always easier to pick out stems than pick off stems. Do not forget that. We're also gonna add some carrots and some celery. Very traditional, of course. We're also gonna add just a touch of sugar to balance the bitterness in the beer and some freshly ground black pepper. And then last but not least, we're gonna add enough chicken broth to just basically come up to the top of the ingredients. All right, just a couple cups. Now, as far as salt goes, I generously salted my beef and I also generously salted the onions. So I think I'm okay for now. Of course, you're gonna taste and adjust as you go. That's the rule. And then what we're gonna do, which is fairly standard stew procedure, you can turn the heat up to high, bring it up to a gentle simmer, and then you'll adjust your heat and back it down. You want it just lightly bubbling like that. And then basically we're just gonna cover that and cook it till fork tender, which is gonna take about two hours. Depends on how big you cut your beef. And of course, with any simmering stew, every once in a while, take off the lid, give it a stir. If you want to skim a little bit of foam or fat from the top, feel free. And by the way, we did not add any flour or roux to this. So we're going to thicken this naturally, which is going to be the next step. So after two hours, mine was fork tender. Well, technically it was knife tender. And if it's tender, you're ready for the last step. Raise the heat to medium high and boil that for about 15, 20 minutes until it reduces and thickens slightly. And even though we didn't use any flour or roux or any thickeners like that, that connective tissue in the meat will break down and get nice and sticky. And it will combine with that tomato paste in there to form this beautiful, beautiful texture. I mean, look at that. It looks like we thickened it, but we didn't. That is just natural stewy goodness. And there you go. You can see those thyme stems. Very simple to pick out now. All right, so don't waste your time. Sorry, no rim shot. That was not an intentional pun. Doesn't count. Of course, you know you got to taste this for final seasoning. Might need a little salt. If you put in a little cayenne, I wouldn't be mad. And if I'm not mistaken, that is ready to serve. And what should you serve it with? There's only one choice, some kind of potatoes. 
So I'm going to do a nice ring of green onion mashed potatoes. And look at that stew. That really was one of the better stews I've had in a long, long time. And I eat awesome stews on a regular basis. That maltiness from that dark beer really does amazing things to this gravy. A very simple dish, yet at the same time, it has a very rich, deep, complex flavor. Just a gorgeous bowl of food. So anyway, that's it. Beef and Guinness stew. I really hope you give this a try, whether it's for St. Patrick's Day or just any time of the year. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy an Aaron Go Bra. Irish soda bread. That's right, I'm going to show you how to make Ireland's second favorite food after potatoes. Well, actually, I guess it would be third favorite if you count beer as a food, which they do. But regardless, with St. Patrick's Day coming up, I thought I'd show you my take on this classic Irish quick bread. So let's go ahead and get started by getting our dry ingredients together. And for that, we're going to use some flour, just regular white all-purpose flour, which you can use exclusively for this recipe. But for my version, I'm also going to add a little bit of whole wheat flour, as well as a little bit of oatmeal. Those are just some rolled oats. I'm actually using the quick cooking version, but just regular rolled oats will work the same. And then we're also going to need some salt, as well as some baking soda, which is one of the key ingredients here, hence the name, as well as a little touch of baking powder. And once all that's together, we'll take our whisk, and in lieu of sifting, we will give this a thorough, thorough mixing to make sure everything's combined and nicely aerated. So give that a good whisking for a minute or two, and once that's set, we can cut in our butter. So what you want to do before you start this recipe is cut up your butter into chunks and put it in the freezer for about 10 or 15 minutes so it's very firm for this step. Because what we're going to do is add that to the flour and then take one of these pastry cutters, also known as pastry blenders, and cut the fat into the flour. And eventually that's going to break up all your butter into nice little tiny pieces, which is going to help give this bread such a beautiful texture. And when you first start, don't be surprised if a lot of butter gets gunked up between the wires. No problem, just keep knocking it off with your finger. And eventually, after about four or five minutes, you should have something that looks like this. Okay, kind of a coarse meal. So that's looking good. And once yours looks like that, we can move on to the wet ingredients, which we'll mix up in a separate bowl. So we'll start with one large egg. And then because I'm doing a slightly sweetened version, we're going to do a little bit of honey. And you'll see most recipes call for white sugar, but I'm not sure why. Honey works so much better here, I think. Oh, and by the way, if you have allergies, I heard you're supposed to use only local honey. Although I did see that on the internet, so it's probably not true. But anyway, I thought I'd pass it along. And then we're also going to grate in some fresh orange zest. Although in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm actually using tangerines. Not because I'm always trying to be a little fancy, which I am, but because that's what I had around. So we'll grate in some orange and or tangerine zest, which is going to pair very nicely with the dried fruit we'll eventually put in here. And then last, but certainly not least, we need some buttermilk. And it's the acidity of this buttermilk that's going to react with our baking soda, and that's going to create millions of bubbles, which is what actually causes this bread to rise. And if for whatever reason you can't find buttermilk, I will explain in excruciating detail on the blog how to substitute. And then all we need to do is take a whisk and mix that thoroughly before combining it with our dry ingredients, which is what we're going to do next. Let's grab our bowl of dry stuff and make a little well in the middle, into which we will pour the wet stuff, along with some dried fruit. And I'm going to use a combination of currants and golden raisins. And by the way, other Irish soda bread makers, stop telling people they have to dust their currants with flour before they put them in the batter. All right, you don't. That's a bunch of blarney. Pardon my language. You can just dump them right in. And then we'll take a wooden spoon and stir this together and keep stirring until a very wet, very sticky dough comes together. And I mean wet and sticky. So don't be scared. Just keep stirring and mixing until it all comes together, but still a little bit crumbly. And when it gets to this point, what we'll do is we'll transfer that onto a well-floured work surface, and we'll finish the rest by hand. So make sure you sprinkle a lot of flour on the work surface, as well as over the top and on your hands. But as usual, only using enough to allow you to work with this without it sticking to everything. All right, if we introduce too much flour, it's going to get dry and tough. So be careful. And all we're trying to do here is form this into a large, very soft dough ball. But before we do that, we're going to give it a very brief... I hate to use the term kneading, because we're not really going to knead this. But before I form the ball, I like to kind of press it down like this. And mostly what I'm doing here is testing that I have enough flour. And while it is very, very soft and very, very sticky and very kind of annoying to work with, I am able to fold it like this. I'm just going to fold one edge this way, one edge that way, and then sort of bring the ends in like this to form, as I said, a large, soft dough ball. And yes, I did that kind of quick, which is the point. 
So thank God for the rewind button. So if you need to go watch that a couple times, go ahead. And then once we have our initial dough ball formed, we're going to go ahead and cut that in half because this recipe makes two loaves. And then using just a little more flour, again, only enough to keep it from sticking to things, we will form each half into its own little round loaf. And all we're trying to accomplish here is to get something that's kind of round with a relatively smooth surface. So if you have any giant bubbles or cracks or crevices, like I had right there, kind of work those out. And like I said, we'll just form that into kind of a semi-smooth round ball shape. And I should mention perfection is not important. When these come out of the oven, they look amazing. So as usual, I don't want you to stress too much. And once we've formed our loaves, we'll simply transfer those onto a lined baking sheet. I'm using a silpat, but parchment paper works great. And then once we have those panned up, I like to do one extra little optional step. While my oven is preheating, to 375 by the way, I'm going to let these sit and rest for 15 minutes. And while these are not going to rise up like a yeast bread, you will see them swell up just a little bit as that baking soda reacts with the buttermilk and those bubbles start to form internally. And then before they go in the oven, one of the most important steps, we need to slice an X on the top of each loaf. And for that, I'm going to use a giant serrated knife that I'm going to wipe off after each cut. And we're doing this for three reasons. One, it's decorative. Two, it has the proven ability to ward off the devil. And third, and most importantly, by cutting through that now sort of dry surface into the wet dough, that's really going to aid in the initial rise as this goes in the hot oven. All right, so kind of a big deal. And please make sure you're cutting down in far enough. Okay, you're the Crosby, Stills, and Nash of your Irish soda bread dough gash. So make sure you're cutting down in at least a half inch. And then once those loaves have been X'd, we can go ahead and transfer those into the center of our preheated 375 degree oven for 45 minutes or until they look amazing. Check it out. That is some gorgeous soda bread. It should be beautifully browned and also way too hot to eat. So don't even think of slicing in. I know it's tempting, but if you slice it now, a lot of moisture is going to escape and you're going to have a drier loaf. And you don't want a drier loaf, do you? Of course not. So let it cool. But then once it is, we're ready to slice in. And they say a perfect soda bread is as rare as a four-leaf clover. But that's not true. Four-leaf clovers are much more common. But I am happy to report we beat the odds and this was absolutely perfect. I mean, look at that grain. This came out so light, so tender. Not dry at all, which is the fatal flaw of a lot of soda breads. And then once we have that sliced up, I'm going to serve mine as tradition would dictate, slathered with copious amounts of Irish butter. Yes, I actually went out and bought Irish butter because I am that person. And yes, I know green was not the best choice color-wise to show off this gorgeous slice of bread. But on the other hand, it did have shamrocks, so I went with it. And once that was properly buttered, I gave it a bite and it really was tremendous. I mean, perfect texture aside, I just love the flavor, the subtle sweetness from the honey and dried fruit playing off that little bit of tanginess from the buttermilk. And by the way, because we made it right and only used tiny amounts, there is absolutely no aftertaste of baking powder or baking soda. So you're not going to have to worry about that. But anyway, that's it. My take on Irish soda bread. I mean, I don't want to Saint Patty myself on the back too much, but this really did come out great. And I hope you give it a try very soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Kanishes. That's right, I got a food wish for a Kanish, which was actually submitted a long time ago. But if you've read the fine print on our terms of service, food wishes have no expiration date. And I'm finally getting around to showing you one of my all-time favorite snacks, which I used to enjoy with my father every time we go to Coney Island. So not only am I taking care of a viewer's request, I'm also attempting to recapture my youth, which is kind of nice. And to get started, we're going to make a very, very simple dough that will begin by adding some salt and baking powder to some all-purpose flour. And then we'll take a whisk and give that a thorough mix. And once that's been accomplished, we will make a well in the center and proceed to add our wet ingredients, which will include one large beaten egg, a little touch of vinegar or lemon juice, a whole bunch of vegetable oil, and then last but not least, some warm water. All right, basically the same temperature we'd use for a yeast dough even though this recipe does not include yeast. And then what we'll do is get right in there with our hand, and we'll mix this until it comes together into a very, very soft ball of dough. And even though this dough is very wet and soft, because it has so much oil in it, it's really not that sticky. So I find this to be an extremely enjoyable dough to work with. And then what we'll do once that's all pulled together is transfer it onto a floured surface, and we will knead that for about three or four minutes until we have a very smooth, very soft, fairly elastic dough. 
Oh, and by the way, this dough recipe will make 16 knishes. Although for the video, I'm only going to make eight today. And if you were to do the same, you can freeze the dough for future use. But anyway, like I said, we'll go ahead and knead the dough until we have something as smooth, soft, and elastic. At which point we're going to wrap that in plastic. And we'll go ahead and let that rest in the fridge for an hour or two while we move on to make our filling. Which in the classic version at least, is made up mostly of potatoes. So I went ahead and peeled and quartered three russets that we're going to boil in salted water until just tender, as tested with a knife. Oh, and by the way, you see that little brown spot where I missed one of the eyes? For your information, that is not toxic or poisonous, which some people believe, but it's not, so relax. And then what we'll do once our potatoes are cooked is drain those very well, and we'll transfer those into a mixing bowl and proceed to mash them, or I guess rice them if you have a ricer, which I think we've already established I don't. But anyway, we'll go ahead and smash those up. And those are now ready to finish with what traditionally would be a lot of onions fried in chicken fat. Although we're going to be doing a little bit of a twist on that today. So we'll go ahead and set those aside and move on to the aforementioned twist, which is going to be to chop up some leftover corned beef and cabbage. So yes, we're doing a very special post St. Patrick's Day leftover edition. And we'll chop up a few what are hopefully fairly fatty pieces of corned beef, as well as a little bit of that leftover braised cabbage. And if you do plan on adding extra meats and vegetables to your potato onion mixture, I think we want to make sure we chop it up pretty fine. And you'll see why when we actually form our knishes. So we'll go ahead and chop that stuff up fairly fine, at which point we'll head to the stove, where we're going to add one diced onion to a whole bunch of melted butter set over medium heat, along with, of course, a nice big pinch of salt. And we will also add in our corned beef and cabbage. And then we would usually just saute this until the onions turn translucent, but not this time. All right, we're going to cook this for about 10 minutes or so until several things happen. Okay, our onions are going to soften and sweeten and turn a golden brown, as well as our little pieces of cabbage are going to caramelize, which is one of the most underrated delicious flavors ever. And, and maybe most importantly, that fat is going to render out of our corned beef and add a beautiful richness to this mixture. All right, as I mentioned, traditionally this would have a ton of chicken fat in it, also known as schmaltz which is amazing, but I didn't have any around. So to make up for that, we're gonna use butter infused with corned beef fat, which ended up working very nicely. So we're gonna take our time here, and we're gonna cook our mixture until it looks a little something like this, at which point we'll go ahead and transfer that into our mashed potatoes. And we'll season it up very simply with some kosher salt, some freshly ground black pepper and a little touch of cayenne. And we'll take our spatula and mix all that together. And believe it or not, that's it. We will simply give that a taste for seasoning. And assuming it has enough salt, and or whatever else you're flavoring this with, we'll just let that cool down to room temp before moving on to final production, which means pulling out our now well-rested dough. And we'll place that on a nice floured surface. And we'll dust a little more flour over the top. And then we'll go ahead and press this out with our hands into a rectangular shape. Oh, and just a quick reminder that we're only using half the dough we made. But anyway, we'll go ahead and press that out. And then we'll switch to a rolling pin. And we will roll that out into a nice big rectangle, about an eighth of an inch thick. And as usual, just get it close with the rolling pin. And then we can do a little fine tuning by stretching and pulling the corners. And then once that's been accomplished, we can go ahead and place down about three cups or so of our filling, which by now should be fully cooled down to room temp. And we'll place that down on the dough as shown, about three inches from the edge. And this is probably a good time to remind you that you can literally put anything you want in these. Okay, broccoli, mushrooms, other kind of meats. But anyway, we'll go ahead and place on our filling as evenly as possible. And then once that's set, before we roll this up, we'll go ahead and paint on some egg wash along the opposite edge. And in case you're new around here, an egg wash is simply one egg that's beaten with a couple teaspoons of water. And then once that's been applied, we will go ahead and stretch our dough over the top. And it's okay if we stretch this really thin, in fact, it's probably better. And then once our filling's been covered, we'll go ahead and roll that over. And we will continue rolling until we have just a couple inches of dough left. And as we're doing this, we'll want to try to keep this as uniform as possible. And by the way, when you get near the end, if you happen to tear or rip your dough like I just did, don't worry about it. As you'll see, once these are formed and baked, they're going to look amazing and you'll never know the difference. But anyway, like I said, we'll go ahead and roll that until we have just a couple inches of dough left. At which point, we'll go ahead and grab that and stretch it over the top. 
And then once that's happened, we'll kind of roll this over so the seam's on the bottom. And we'll also want to make sure we give both ends a nice pressing so our filling is trapped in. And that's it. At this point, we can do a little fine tuning by giving it a little roll like this to make sure that tube is as uniform as possible. And then you're probably going to have a couple extra inches of dough on the ends, which we will trim off as we see fit. And then what we'll do is take our bench scraper or the back of a knife, and we will divide this into eight equal pieces. But do not cut through. We are just making marks for equal portions and maybe possibly trimming a little more dough off the end. And then once we have our dough marked, we can move on to the most fun part of this production. And that would be cutting these up with the side of our hand. All right, so make sure the side of your hand is floured. And then we're gonna cut these by pressing our hand straight down through and sort of rubbing it back and forth until we hit the table. Although generally I like to press first and then finish separating these with the final rub and cut. And while there are so many ways you can cut and shape these, this is definitely my favorite. And there's something about the way that dough is smeared when we make these cuts, which I think helps give them such a unique appearance once they're baked. And then once those are portioned, here's how we're gonna shape them. We're simply gonna flip it up on its end so that one cut ends on the bottom with the other one facing up. And then we'll simply shape these by squishing them down, sort of tucking everything into the center as we press this down into a puck shape. And I know it looks a little odd and possibly provocative, but as you'll see, these are gonna bake up beautifully. Okay, so let's try that one more time. Okay, once separated, we will tip that up so one cuts on the bottom and the other cuts on the top. And then we sort of flatten and press while we're tucking everything into the center. Oh, by the way, if you notice that bubble, that is not a problem. All right, a few bubbles here and there are actually a good sign. And that's it, once we finish our knishes, we'll go ahead and transfer those onto a line baking sheet. But before we do, we're gonna brush the bottoms with oil and very generously. And that's gonna help us achieve a nice beautifully brown bottom. And then what we're gonna do once those have been panned up as shown is finish by brushing these all over with some egg wash, which is optional. A lot of people don't use anything. Or if you want, you can actually brush these with oil, which is gonna give you a little bit of a different, possibly crisper texture. So you decide. I mean, you are after all the commissioner of your Kanisha's conditioner. Take that MF Doom. But anyway, the point is use what you want or nothing. But I do like the texture and color the egg wash gives it. And that's it, once those have been brushed, those are ready to transfer into the center of a 375 degree oven for about 40 minutes or so, or until lightly golden brown and looking something like this. Check it out. I think Yona Schimmel would be proud. And thanks to that oil we brushed on, the bottom should be nicely browned. And then if you want, you can eat these hot, but I don't recommend it. I think they are significantly more delicious, just barely warm or room temperature. So you do what you want, but I let mine cool down all the way before plating up. And I went in for a bite. And that, my friends, is some extreme carbon carb action. It's an extremely delicious and extremely comforting and extremely filling. All right, long before energy bars came around, this is the kind of thing people snacked on to keep them going through a long, hard day at work. And as much as I love the classic potato, onion, chicken fat version from my childhood, this slightly less fattier version with the corned beef and cabbage was amazing. And since they are so delicious at room temp, they are perfect for things like picnics and cookouts, or just something to put in your lunch bag to bring to work to tease your coworkers, especially the ones doing keto. You are definitely gonna wanna eat this in front of them. But no matter where you plan to eat this, or what you plan to put in it, I really do hope you give these delicious knishes a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Irish Shepherd's Pie. Irish because we're using Irish cheddar, we're using the authentic lamb, and when it's gone, you're going to say to yourself, Irish, I had more. All right, to get started, we're gonna put a little bit of olive oil and butter in a Dutch oven on medium heat. I'm gonna throw in a diced onion and lamb. A couple pounds of ground lamb. Shepherd's pie is made with lamb, not beef. All right, shepherds raise sheep, not cows. So when you make a shepherd's pie with beef, you call it a cottage pie? That makes no sense. 
All right, and you want to take a wooden spoon, and while that cooks, you want to break it up nice and small. There's going to be a lot of liquid that comes out, a lot of water. Don't worry. That's going to evaporate, and eventually you'll start hearing it sizzle, and it will start to brown nicely. Ideally, it leaves you a nice brown fond on the bottom of the pan. All right, when it gets to that point, which took me about 10 minutes or so, I'm going to add a nice big spoon of flour. That's going to make that beautiful thick gravy that holds all this together. And we're going to cook that flour for just about three or four minutes. And while we're cooking the raw edge off that flour, let's go ahead and add our seasoning. We're going to go with salt and pepper, some fresh rosemary, a little bit of paprika, a little touch of cinnamon, some ketchup, which I hear people in Europe love, and some fresh minced garlic. We're going to stir that in. And I know some of that's not classic, classic shepherd's pie. But you know what? The Irish are a very experimental people, and I think they would approve. So by the time we added our seasoning and stirred it in, the flour has been cooking long enough, and we're going to add our liquid. I'm adding water. Now you can add chicken broth, you can add beef broth, but lamb is a pretty strongly flavored meat. So it really doesn't add a whole heck of a lot. All right, we're going to give it a stir. It's going to thicken up very quickly because we used a good amount of flour. And we're just going to cook this for about five or six minutes until it really thickens up nice. I mean really thick. It should look something like that. And at that point you can turn off the heat and it's time to add the vegetables, which are peas and carrots. Now since we're using frozen peas, I'm going to be nice and let you use frozen carrots. They come with the frozen peas in the same bag. As soon as the vegetables are stirred in, we're going to transfer this into your casserole dish. Any kind of large baking dish will work. I believe this is 9 by 13. You're going to spread it out and you're going to tap it down, not the old tapa tapa. We're going to use the spatula and just smooth it out. All right, so that's all set. We're going to set that aside until our potato crust is ready, which is made from potatoes, the most Irish of all ingredients. By the way, indigenous to America, you're welcome, Ireland. I think you've more than made up for it by sending us all those policemen. All right, so we're going to boil a couple pounds of potatoes. I'm using Yukon Gold. I think they make a beautiful crust, nice color, nice texture. So we're going to boil those in salted water until tender. We're going to drain them thoroughly. All right, toss in some butter, some cayenne, some salt, of course, some cream cheese, and some Irish cheddar. I want you to go to one of the big supermarkets and try to find Irish cheddar. It's really, really good. I'm using one called Dubliner, which is not that hard to find. If you can't find Irish cheddar, any kind of sharp white cheddar will work. All right, we're going to take a potato masher and mash all that together. And when that's thoroughly incorporated, I'm going to also add one egg yolk that I'm going to beat with a couple tablespoons of milk. I'm going to pour that in, stir it in. When that's all mixed in, go ahead and top your meat. But here's how you're going to want to do it. Place big spoonfuls on top. Don't just dump it on top because you don't want to mix the filling, the meat mixture, into the crust. So I like to put dollops all over the top, then take a fork and even it all out. Now there's lots of ways you can do this. You can leave it really rough and rugged, very similar to the terrain of the Irish Shepherd. Or you can take a fork and make one of these kind of crosshatch designs. I think that looks pretty cool. Or if you're insane like me, you can spend 15 minutes mimicking the pattern on the wool sweaters worn by the Shepherds. All right. Once the topping's done, we're going to put that in a 375 degree oven for about 25 30 minutes what you're looking for is this a beautiful crust you're gonna see that gravy bubbling around the outside and of course something like this you gotta let sit at least 15 minutes but you know what i didn't wait i'm gonna admit it right now the sun was going down and i wanted to get the final money shots so i just said i'm going in with the spatula but you know what it worked everything was fine in fact more than fine just amazing there's nothing better than a well-made shepherd's pie that slightly gamey yet beautifully flavored lamb, the vegetables, that thick rich gravy, and then the Irish cheddar in the potatoes on the top, so perfect. It would be a great change of pace to that corned beef and cabbage for St. Patrick's Day, or have both, even better. So there you go, Irish shepherd's pie. I hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. Cream of green garlic and potato soup. I love potato anything. I love soup and I love garlic. So it was no surprise at all that I thought this was just a fantastic, fantastic soup. So here's how I put it together. I had one bunch, which was, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
stocks. Is that the right term? Stocks? Actually, I guess they're bulbs, if you want to get technical. What I did is I cut off the root end right there. I cut off most of the dark green. So you mostly want to use the white parts and the light green parts. I chopped it in like half inch pieces, although that's not a big consideration because this is all going to get simmered down very tender. After I chopped my garlic, I soaked it in water and make sure to rinse off any sand, any dirt. All right, dirt not advisable in soup. So my garlic is prepped. I'm going to set that aside and I'm going to start cooking some pork product in a little bit of olive oil. Now I'm using prosciutto scraps chopped up. You may remember these from such videos as roast asparagus with prosciutto and poached egg. All right, so on medium heat, I'm going to cook that prosciutto for about two minutes just until it starts sizzling. Feel free to use pancetta or bacon or ham or shiitake mushrooms if you want to go vegetarian. I'm going to add my green garlic that's been drained, of course. I'm going to sweat that for about two, three minutes. I don't want to brown the green garlic. I want it to keep kind of a, I don't know, a sharper flavor. I don't want it to caramelize and get sweet. I don't want like a roasted garlic flavor. At this point, I seasoned fairly lightly with salt, pepper, and a little cayenne. So just a few minutes sweating in that little bit of olive oil and a little bit of rendered pork fat. At that point, I'm going to dump in one quart of broth. I'm using chicken broth. You could certainly use vegetable broth. I'm going to bring that to a simmer. And when it just starts to simmer, I'm going to turn the heat to low. I'm going to put the lid on and I'm going to let that simmer for 30 minutes. I want that garlic to get very, very soft. And some of the darker green sections of the garlic are very tough. All right, so they do need a little bit of time to get tender. So while that's simmering, I have a half hour to prep my potatoes. I'm going to peel four medium russet, cut them in equally sized chunks, and just keep those in water until you need it. Once the half hour has elapsed, drain the potatoes, carefully add them to the stock. By the way, aren't you glad I said carefully? Because, you know, you totally would have splashed yourself with hot stock had I not said that. All right, so once the potatoes are in, I'm going to give those a stir, and we're going to cook this until the potatoes are tender. Now, if you want to cover it, go ahead. I didn't cover mine. I like to kind of watch my soup. Just keep it simmering. If it looks like it's getting too dry and the potatoes are becoming uncovered, add a little more stock or water. All right, so this simmered for another 30 minutes or so until they were tender. And how do I know? I do the old smasha smasha. You take one of the potatoes with a wooden spoon, and if it smashes against the pot easily, you're done. Okay, to finish the soup, very simple. Take a slotted spoon or one of these strainers and take out all the big chunks, transfer that into a bowl. So basically we just want the big chunks of potato and some other green garlic. I don't like a completely smooth soup. Creamy, smooth, yes, a little bit, but I do want some texture. I'm gonna transfer that into a blender and be very careful. When you blend soups like this, you gotta add a little bit of hot stock to get it going but don't fill it all the way to the top. It will fly out the top and burn your face, which is never good. Also, you wanna put a towel over the top like that. You're gonna pulse that on and off, scrape it down or push it down with a spoon once in a while. So you're pretty much making sure everything purees. All right, so once that's all pureed, put it back into the pot. We're gonna add our heavy cream. All right, because this is a cream of soup. We're gonna put that back on medium low heat, not too high. As soon as that cream heats through, your soup is ready to eat. Of course, pop quiz, what do you have to do before you serve it? That's right, taste and adjust the seasoning. And you can see there, a smooth texture, a luxurious creamy texture, but still has some pieces of the prosciutto, some pieces of the potatoes, some pieces of the green garlic. And to me, that's just a perfect, perfect texture. All right, and then keeping with the theme, I'm gonna sprinkle some fresh chopped chives on the top. Check it out. That's some quality sprinkling. It's not easy to get them spread out like that. By the way, I minored in that in culinary school, herb distribution. And there you go. Cream of green garlic and potato soup. And the flavor is so unique. It's not exactly like garlic, all right? It's somewhere between like a garlic and a leek and an onion and a green onion and a chive and a shallot, okay? Somewhere in there, you get the idea. Very delicious. All right, you got the potato, who doesn't love that? Just a great, great bowl of soup. So I hope you give it a try. Go to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Kolkanen. That's right, Kolkanen named, of course, after the famous weapon used by the leprechauns to defeat the Vikings that built Stonehenge in the famous Second Battle of Blarney Castle. 
And of course, I'm just kidding. Everybody knows it was the third Battle of Blarney Castle. Anyway, it's an amazingly delicious potato dish and very traditional for St. Patrick's Day. And here is how you put it together. So we're going to put our potatoes on to boil. I have russet potatoes I quartered. We want to boil those in salted water until perfectly tender. And while those are simmering, I'm going to go ahead and prep my greens. So I'm going to use a big old handful of kale. That's about four or five ounces. All right, my market sells it already chopped up in bags. So all I need to do is sort of peel off those bigger stems. I just want the leaves. All right, you can also use Swiss chard. You can use cabbage. You can use a lot of things. Okay, so my kale is prepped. I'm also going to chop up a leek. Now you can do this with just green onions, but I really do enjoy leeks. So I'm going to have those and slice them across. And I'm going to stick with the white and light green parts. See those dark green parts? Those can be very, very fibrous and tough. All right, so you don't want to use too much of that, especially since this is not going to cook very long. All right, we're just going to give these a quick blanch. And of course, those need to be rinsed really well. Leeks sometimes have a lot of sand in them. I'm going to add that to the kale. And lastly, I'm going to chop up a bunch of green onions. And by the way, save a little bit to garnish the top later. So I'm going to toss those in a blender. I'm going to go ahead and blanch the kale and leeks in boiling salted water. So what we're going to do here is we're going to bring the water to a boil, dump in the vegetables, give it a good mix. This is on high heat, of course. When that comes back to a boil, we're going to cook that for about five to six minutes. All right, the vegetables are going to stay green, but they're just going to tenderize slightly. And remember, we're going to grind this down in the blender anyway. All right, so again, mine came back to a boil, boiled for five minutes. I fished it out with my strainer. All right, so we're going to toss that into a blender and puree it with some butter. And you know the drill. Just keep pulsing it on and off, on and off. You're going to have to really use your spatula to scrape it down. All right, there's not a lot of liquid in here, which is good. There's nothing worse than watery colconin. And yes, we're both thinking the same thing. He forgot to put in the butter. I did. So I put it in right here. All right, and another tip besides put it in at the same time as the greens, use room temperature butter. My butter was cold and rock hard, so it was really hard to puree in here. So this took me like three or four minutes. If your butter's soft, this is only going to take you a minute. Anyway, regardless, puree that in a blender until fairly fine and reserve until needed. All right, theoretically, by this point, your potatoes are cooked. You're going to drain them extremely well, put them back into the dry pot, mash them with a little bit of butter, but not all the way. All right, just to get it started, because what we're going to do, we're going to add our green stuff and we're going to mash that in. And you're going to see as soon as you start mashing that kale and leek and onion mixture in, the color just turns into this incredibly beautiful shade of green. Is it clover green? Is it emerald green? Is it Boston Celtic green? I don't know. It reminds me of spring and it makes me happy. All right, we're almost done here. I'm going to go ahead and season this with some salt and pepper to taste. What about cayenne? I didn't use any. Do they use cayenne in Ireland? All right, somebody report back to me on that. And then last but not least, if you want to put in just a little small splash of cream or milk, or you know what I wish I had? Homemade creme fraiche. But a little touch of dairy here at the end lightens it up. And that is done. All right, I'm going to spoon that into an Irish style bowl. And I think it's actually a law. You must garnish your colconin with butter. That's right, more butter on top. It's going to melt into those steaming hot potatoes. And it's going to make it basically irresistible. I'm going to finish with some fresh green onion. And that is, by far, my favorite traditional St. Patrick's Day food. All right, let's river dance this fork into that pile of buttery goodness. And some recipes, I just don't even need to explain how good that's going to be. All right, those comforting buttery potatoes, that beautiful earthy green kale. All right, the slight pungency from the onion and the leek. Just a perfect, perfect springtime treat. And one I hope you try for your St. Patrick's Day feast. Anyway, head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy 